The projector starts, and so begins this episode of Movie Nights and Matinees, a podcast for people who enjoy movies from when we actually had to go to the movies. I'm your host, Bill Groves, and this is episode 31, Kids and Classics, in which Jim Reed and I talk with our guest about exposing kids to films from the beginnings of the medium through the golden age of Hollywood. To get into the proper mood, you might want to set yourself up with some milk and cookies for this one, or maybe a bowl of Cap'n Crunch. this movie with Douglas Fairbanks. Did you see that? I've never seen a movie. What? Isn't it appalling? You've never seen a movie? Not ever. Papa George won't let me. He's very strict about it. I love the movies. My father always took me for my birthday. Hi, everybody. Thanks for listening. In prior episodes, Jim and I have both talked about how we came to be lovers of classic cinema. Although Jim got a head start on me, I believe we were both around the same age when we were bitten by the proverbial bug, which was during our early teenage years. Well, today's guest has made it her mission to cultivate an appreciation for vintage films among potential cinephiles of even younger years, as represented by her book, Movies Are Magic. Her name is Jennifer Churchill, and she's going to talk to us about her book and the ways in which she lures youngsters into an appreciation of the classics. So, Jennifer, welcome to Movie Nights and Matinees. Hello. Hi, Bill. Hi, Jim. Nice to meet you. Hello. Happy to be here. Well, why don't we start out with kind of putting yourself in the, the mode of your target audience for this book and tell us what began your love of classic films? You know, it's something it was it was sort of a family affair when I was young. I was growing up in the 70s and, you know, there was only three channels, three networks, no cable in my little town I was growing up in in, in mid Michigan and the PBS or whatever those extra random channels were that would show classic movies on Sunday afternoons. And my mom was sort of my Google. She would say, oh, that's Catherine Hepburn and that's Cary Grant because there wasn't anyone doing an intro and there was nowhere to find out all this information. So she would tell me all this stuff. And my grandmother loved classic movies. And my Aunt Michelle, my mom's sister, loved classic movies. And we would always watch the Academy Awards together. That was the one night I could stay up and get a late slip to go into school late. Because in, on the East Coast, the Academy Awards would end at like 1 a.m. And we would stay up and watch till the end. <laughs> so that was the one thing I could stay up and watch. And so I just sort of grew up with this affection for them. And um, and then when I went to college, I went to Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I had this amazing professor there, Dr. Andrew Jeffcheck, um, who has passed on since, sadly. And he taught film history and uh, film appreciation classes. And I was an English lit major, so I read a lot and I took a lot of his classes. And then I became his assistant and helped other students write essays and things like that. And so I ended up getting a history cognate, like a basically like a minor in film history, because I took all of his classes. I took every single class I could. That was the first time I realized it could be an academic pursuit of sorts. You know, I, I grew up in a town of 900 people in a cornfield and there was there was no one in the industry or anything like that. Um, I've since learned that Buster Keaton spent his summers in Muskegon, Michigan, and that's where they have the annual Buster Keaton International Film Festival. And I've been to the house Buster Keaton lived in which is just this random house people live in. It's not, you know, something you're supposed to go tour. But anyway, so there wasn't a lot of film industry stuff happening where I grew up. But it, over the years, I discovered my love for it. All right. Was that Jingle's Jungle, the house you're referring to? Uh... Um, I, it didn't have a name. They might have called, there might have been a name for a community of like vaudeville performers. And, you know, supposedly that's where Houdini gave Buster Keaton his nickname of Buster because he was at the house when he was little and saw he was friends with Buster's parents and saw him tumble down the stairs and said, wow, what a Buster. And that supposedly that's that's the legend. Supposedly that was in that house, but it's just a small little lake house on Lake Michigan in this little town of Muskegon. And there was a community of people who 
supposedly all kind of, well, not supposedly, they did live in this um, kind of neighborhood that they hung out in in the summertime when they were off, when they weren't traveling and touring and performing. And so he he did have a, a house there. The the Keaton house was there. And there's okay. a statue of Buster Keaton now in the, in the town and they do the annual festival there. So that's, that's sort of my classic movie connection to Michigan because otherwise there's not a whole lot. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I think Jingles Jungle came later then because that was, yeah. I think, just, I don't think that was big enough to have a staircase. That was Joe's nickname for a, a little cabin bungalow kind of thing that they built as the community, I guess, expanded later on. But it mm-hmm. sounds like the house that you visited was one from earlier in the, uh, in, yeah. the in their life. And yeah, career. Jingles was Keaton's younger brother's nickname. Yeah, Harry. Yeah. yeah. Named Jingles. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, now your book is uh, Movies Are Magic. And the one I got was the director's cut. So we'll have you explain that in a bit. But it says in partnership with the film detective. Now, I keep seeing the logo and the name film detective here and there on the net. Can you tell us a little bit about what the film detective is and your association with it? Yeah, it's a streaming channel. You can find it on Oh, I forget all the different streaming Pluto, all the, you know, all the, the smaller streaming, um, streaming networks sling. It's its own channel. It's the name's a little off putting because it's not really a detective channel. It's just classic movies. And Phil Hopkins started that channel. He uh, restores films, releases a lot of DVDs on Blu-ray of restoring mostly sort of like unheard of movies and obscure movies, but he has a passion for that. And so he pulled together all of the movies he had acquired and films he'd acquired either in the front, they're in the public domain and he restored them or they're just in the public domain. And so that's what the film detective channel was. I think I said his name is Phil Hopkins and he um, recently sold it. So he's no longer affiliated with it. And it sort of got corporatized into Cinedime. If you've heard of Cinedime. So it's part, the film detective is part of Cinedime. So the, it, the channel still exists, but it's not the same. And Phil's gone on to now start the film masters, which is sort of what he was doing before and on, on his own. So the film detective, as I was working with them, doesn't exist anymore, is what I'm, I guess, saying in a long-winded way. But it's still great, and you can find it streaming. And we did season one. We're working on season two, and we're just not sure if it's going to launch on the film detective. But the first season we did with Phil intimately involved, and my son and I, who's now nine, he was eight at the time, we did um, 10 intros to 10 classic movies. And it's really just us doing kind of like a three to five minute intro. And then the film itself plays and then we do an outro. So we don't really interrupt or interfere with the film itself. We just, it's just kind of end cap with us introing it. And the idea was just to have another avenue out there that would help make it fun for kids. We talk about uh, in the intros, we try to, we make it fun. We do little graphics and cute little things and try to just make it seem fun and exciting for, for kids. And you also had done, now I gather this is a separate thing, but you had done mm-hmm. a Movies Are Magic radio show, which also was available as a podcast. Yeah. And that was on internet radio? So it's actually an actual radio show on KSBY Sonoma 91.3 in Sonoma, California on Sunday nights at seven. So I just go in the studio. I don't, I don't podcast every single episode, but then I do podcast up some. Some I use music and, you know, the copyright issue thing. So when you're on the radio, it's fine. You can play whatever. And I'll try to play songs from old movies. So it's just a one hour show and I'll interview someone kind of like what you do. I'll find someone specifically in the classic movie world and do a like a 15 minute interview. And then I will talk about I try to make it exciting and current and talk about the things happening now in the classic movie world, like the film noir festival and you know, the Turner Classic Movie Classic Film Festival and and all the different there's I mean, there's a lot of film festivals going on that celebrate classic movies and different events going on. So I'll try to talk about current things that make it seem alive and exciting and new. And then the last segment, I play music connected to whatever whatever we had talked about earlier in the show. So some of them I do pad- podcasts out and it. I just do it through like Buzzsprout. And so it's out on all the we're all wherever the podcasts get pushed out from there. So, yeah, so that's not a huge, huge thing I do. It's sort of just a fun, a fun way for me to get to talk to people in the industry. (laughs) Like I've interviewed Eddie Muller on there and just different people. I haven't haven't gotten Leonard Maltin like you guys have. Oh, well, yeah, that was that was a a while coming, but uh, I was glad to have been able to do it. 
So what prompted you, I guess this is a kind of a two pronged question. What mm -hmm. prompted you to, to do the movies are magic book, but mm -hmm. I guess that would be preceded by what prompted you to focus on getting youngsters interested in classic films? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have been going, well, I've been, I've loved classic movies since I was a kid. And then I kind of went into journalism and I always, I'd always find the gig writing film reviews and things like that. But I mostly do PR for my day job. And I've always gone to the TCM Classic Film Festival, which started in 2010, was the first one. And I was living, I now live in California, but I was living in Michigan in my little snow covered cornfield <laughs> that I lived in. And I, my friends would tease me because I just had TCM on all the time. The local cable channel, which was like $30 a month for crystal cable in this little town I lived in, they actually carried Turner Classic Movies, which was amazing. And so we always joke Robert Osborne. My friends would call Robert Osborne my boyfriend because I spent every night with him. And <laughs> I just, that's, I just, I'm one of those people, like that's just the only channel I have on and that's what I would watch. And then I remember they had this commercial and they were promoting, we're going to do this film festival in Hollywood in 2010. So this must've been like fall of 2009 and it's four days of old movies in Hollywood. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to that. <laughs> so I went and, you know, there weren't, I don't know exactly how many people were there, but I think it was less than a thousand. It wasn't huge like it is now, like thousands and thousands of people go now and it's this big thing. But that first year, it was kind of a small group of us and there was like more famous people than, you know, nerds like myself. So I went to I went to the opening night screening of A Star is Born, the one with Judy Garland. And it was super fun. And then they had this sort of VIP party afterwards. And I'm just, there's probably a handful of us who weren't big stars there. And I'm just sitting there and like, share is just sitting there and Alec Baldwin's, you know, at the bar being goofy and, you know, all these people are there and I'm like, wow, this is pretty exciting just to be. And, and everyone was a classic movie fan. Everyone was there talking about classic movies. And, you know, of course, Robert Osborne was there and Eva Marie Saint was there. And you know, I talked to her for a long time and I said, I'm just really here to meet Robert Osborne. And she's like, you come with me, dragged me over and <laughs> sat me down with Robert. And then I just sat there and hung out with him and so I go, I go every year and I become friends with, you know, all the people involved, the TC, a lot of the TCM execs and a lot of the fans who go every year. And people kept talking about, you know, they're worried about having a future audience of these movies because we're an older bunch <laughs> and we're, you know, we're, we're in an older demographic and they're, you know, they're really worried about it still being relevant to people and people watching it and getting the eyeballs on the channel and then 2014, uh, well, 2013, I got pregnant with my now nine-year-old. And so I really started thinking about like, well, how do I get him into these movies? And so I, I started showing him things that I thought I kind of wanted to limit his screen time, you know, as a young child. But of course, I wanted to introduce him to classic movies. And so I tried to find things that in my mind, I'm like, what would appeal to a two-year-old? And so I would put on Top Hat with Fred Astaire and the tap dancing and the all this, you know, tap dancing captures you know the attention of a two-year-old it's loud and it's kind of fun and it goes along with dancing and so he loved top hat and we'd watch that and then he loved anything like he loved um of course our gang you know that's just adorable it's like watching your friends when you're that age and and anything any of the silent comedians like lloyd and keaton and chaplin it's just like watching a cartoon to a kid it, you don't have to read the inner titles and understand really it's just physical comedy and falling over chairs. And so he loved that. He loves Buster Keaton. Um, and it's so I'm thinking, you know, yeah. And so I'm like, how do I, how do I share this with other kids? And so I started talking to some of my friends at TCM and I kind of wrote, wrote out the, the book and then Ben Mankiewicz, who's a, a host on TCM, he sort of took over for Robert Osborne when he passed away. He wrote the introduction and he happens to have a child the same age as my child. We sort of had kids at the same time. And, you know, I knew him from going to the festival. And so he wrote this really sweet, heartfelt intro where he talks about his daughter, Josie, and hoping that she will love. He has the same, you know, hope that his daughter will love these old movies and and that a larger, uh, you know, that I guess from a commercial standpoint, we they, they need an, a future audience. So they're thinking about that. But really, it's a genuine love of these movies and just wanting them to stay relevant and for people to realize it doesn't have to be a brand new movie. It can be new to you and be a hundred years old. So I just hope kids grow up at least, at least being exposed to it and, 
maybe they might not love it when they're little kids, but they'll come back around to it when they're older. I hope if it's something they grow up with. Yeah. So. Yeah. Jim, you've been to a number of those TCM festivals, haven't you? I haven't been to TCM. I've been to no. Senecon a bunch of times. Oh, hmm. okay. okay. I go to, I've gone to Senecon twice. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an excellent home festival. Yeah. Yeah, I, the thing about TCM that kind of gives me pause is just the fact that they have movies going on in three or four different places at the same time. So it's like I don't want to have to make that choice. It's like Sophie's yeah. choice. I don't. I don't want. It, you know? <laughs> Not quite that serious, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's a lot. You kind of feel overwhelmed when it's all over, but but in a good yeah. way. They'll have when you get the schedule. It's. Thursday's the opening night and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a full day of films and it's mm-hmm. five venues and there's a movie and starting at 9 a.m. and every of each of the five venues you have to pick which one do I want to go to and then, the you know, yeah. and there's movies till midnight in mm-hmm. you know, multiple venues and you sort of have to mm-hmm. pick and choose and when did this movie end and can I make it and you sort of run around trying to make it to each film. Yeah. So it's Well, the first time I went to yeah. Cinecon, I think it was 2007. Mm-hmm. And I had heard about it from other friends, but I finally decided to go this one year. And I mean, it start it starts like Thursday at seven o'clock and then goes all the way till because it's, you know, Labor Day weekend. So mm-hmm. it goes all the way to uh, Monday evening. And it's just movie after movie after movie. And of all the was it 50 or 60 movies they ran that that weekend, I think I had heard of four of them. And I thought yeah. I knew film, you know. But they yeah. really dig into the vaults for that one, you know, which yes. I, I really mm-hmm. enjoyed. Yeah. yeah, it's a little, a little bit more of the obscure, obscure films, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So, does does Weston accompany you to the the festivals at this point? Um, no, I think you have to be thirteen to get a pass. He he went one year with me with a friend who sort of watched him while mommy went to movies, but he was sort of bored because mm. he couldn't couldn't really go to the movies. Most I I the old, I see like some young teens with their parents. I think thirteen is the official age that they won't let you, um, they won't sell you a pass. Oh. Don't quote me on that, but that's well, um, too bad you couldn't do the old Buster Keaton trick, dressing him like an adult and say he's a midget. <laughs> I could, you know, I probably could if I wanted to. <laughs> to but I do hope to bring him with me soon. I mean, he he'll be ten in a couple weeks. Yeah, uh, he's he's in double digits now. Well, he's featured prominently uh, in the book, and he's got his—he's got his name on the cover there, and everything. He does, uh, and yeah, and so is he uh, available to chat with for a couple of minutes? I think so. Here, I'll—I'll—I'll I'll, I'll mute myself and yell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's coming. <laughs> All right. We'll see. We'll see how chatty he is today. <laughs> hey, Weston. Hello. Can you come say hi to Bill and Jim? Here you hi. Can sit down. Hey, Weston, how are you doing? Oops, sorry. Okay. There, there's the man. The man who uh, has oh, a yeah, prominent right photo. <laughs> yeah, prominent photo early in the book. And I, I'm admiring your Buster Keaton pork pie hat. The real deal. Yeah, exactly. Not just a, <laughs> not just one like Buster Keaton had, but an actual Buster Keaton pork pie hat. That is beyond cool, let me tell you. So, yeah, I got a couple of questions for you, Weston. First of all, do you remember how it was that your mom introduced you to classic movies? Do you remember uh, the process or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, been on, right? <laughs> we don't have to do a deep dive there, I guess. Do you remember the first movie that uh, the classic movie that she showed you? Um, uh, um, I think it was um, Casablanca. Hmm. Well, it was all downhill from there. Uh, <laughs> well, she mentioned Top Hat, so uh, I guess that's one that would be a lot of fun. Do you have any favorite actors from all the classic uh, movies you've been watching? Buster Keaton. Ah, well, man of good taste, let me tell you. Have you seen all the movies that are referenced in in your mom's book, Movies Are Magic? Uh, no. No? Yeah. Are there Are there any that you haven't seen yet that you still are kind of looking forward to seeing? Not really. No? Okay. Hit all the bases in terms of your personal preferences, huh? Tell them what's your favorite Buster Keaton movie? Um, Steamboat. Yeah, uh, I forgot what it is. Steamboat Bill Jr.? Yeah. All right. What makes that one your favorite? Um, I don't know. Just like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> direct and to the point. Yeah, it's always tough to 
to single out one of Buster's movies as favorite. I think it's got a great Maybe. tornado scene in it. Yeah. You know what? Actually, one of my favorite gags in that is it's not the one that ever gets included in in clips. But you remember that one where he runs and he jumps up like he's going to climb the fence and it turns out he's on a gate. And so he jumps yeah. over and he's still on the same side of the fence. <laughs> and then he sees the opening, goes to run through it and it slams shut in his face. That one, uh-huh. always, that one always cracks me up. So ha- have you been able to turn any of your friends like at school into classic movie buffs, bring them over and nope. show them anything? Nope. <laughs> have, have you been trying or are they just been uh, saying, no, nope. don't want to do it? No, nope, it's not. That's not your mission. huh? That's that's your mom's. OK. All right. Well, uh... <laughs> you talk in the house called them, Buster. You like that? Mm-hmm. No, he's being shy. <laughs> What's it? So, uh, do you have any other favorites uh, other than Buster Keaton uh, that come no. to mind? No. Okay. Man, man of few words. But have, uh, you, have you gotten to see much Laurel and Hardy? Laurel and Hardy. No. Yes, he's. Oh, you should Maybe watch you like Laurel and Hardy. The Little Rascals. You like Little Rascals? Yeah. Right? Yeah, he's being shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's being featured prominently there right in the (laughs) in the camera okay all right wesson well i won't keep you from your busy schedule any longer but uh (laughs) certainly appreciate you taking a minute to chat with us here and we'll uh we'll continue on so uh could i do check out laurel and hardy though they got some great stuff both silent films and and talkies they're a lot of fun all right thank you thank you you. (laughs) see you down the road (laughs) okay yeah he's being shy (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like I, I said, took him to the theater to see Dracula when he was oh, like yeah? five, and he loved it. No, I remember the name of it, but every time Bella Lugosi would like do a close up, he was like, <laughs> "So I thought I thought maybe we'd make it ten minutes, and he'd want to leave, but we we stayed for all of Dracula." So. Ah, well, have you shown him the Spanish cool. language version because you include that in the book? I haven't. What do you think? So, yeah, that? we talk about it in the oh. book, but he hasn't seen it. Oh, he hasn't seen it yet. No. Okay. No. Yeah, I was I was impressed with some of the films that are in there. I mean, you reference a number of the silent films, the Gold mm-hmm. Rush. Well, going back all the way to the Melies, A Trip to the Moon. Of course. And, and yeah. tying in Hugo, which is a great movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, I tried to make it current. I'm peeking at my at the book right now. But yeah, I tried I tried to sort of just make this create this journey and start out with you know, humans have always been storytellers and here's the different ways humans have told stories. And this is sort of like the newest way humans tell stories is this moving image idea. It's only hundred years old or so. And so it's, it's still this really new art form really compared to painting and books and writing. And I tried to make that linear connection from, from the, the first, you know, cave drawings to the printing press to series motion photography and the Moybridge courses and just the first beginnings of film and then tried to sort of touch on like the first silent movies and I end the book in 1939 with the two big color blockbuster movies Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz because that just seemed to make sense for me and people are always like what you I know a lot of friends who don't really know a lot about classic movies are always shocked when I say, do you know what year do you think The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind came out? And they're like, oh, 70s, 60s. <laughs> I don't, you know, and, and I'm like, no, 1939. And people are always shocked because everything was still in black and white primarily, you know, for decades, decades after that, because they just hadn't figured out how to monetize it or make it work financially. But really, those two, I mean, those, when you watch those, the color's still gorgeous and it's, but anyway, so it's, it seemed like a good stopping point. Maybe there'd be a sequel after that. But I really just wanted them to understand the beginnings of where these YouTube videos and streaming videos and all the stuff they watch every day, where did it come from? And there's really, there wasn't a book like this that showed that and talked mm-hmm. about that. There's a lot of books about like one element, like there's a cute book about Buster Keaton and there's a cute book about Hedy Lamar and you know, there's those books and they're awesome, but I really wanted something that sort of taught them in a really simple way to understand where where these moving images we watch every day, where they came from. Yeah, I like that fact. I was impressed by the fact that you did. You went back to the origins, as you say, the mm-hmm. the you know Moybridge and the the zoetropes and those kinds of things. Uh, what age would you say that the book is really aimed at? Um, it, you know, officially like K to three. But um, probably a little, you know, 
one one to three a little more but you know there's pictures in there too um but as you're far referring, as, like, to, you're referring to gray written, not age yet i mean yes yeah. oh yes okay yeah it's great like kinder, kindergarten through third grade okay um, but then a lot of people i have friends you know teenagers that are like oh i didn't i didn't know this stuff and one of my who's someone who's now a friend that i met at the film festival she had bought the book and then contacted me somehow and sent me a picture of her reading it with her son who's 32 years old and a film director aspiring film director so that was kind of funny so really any age if you don't know the basic history of film it's kind of a good little primer for for any age when i was working one of my big things was trying to get some of the people that i worked with who were like in their 20s and 30s interested in classic movies and it was that was as hard, if not harder than working on kids, you know, because, yeah. you know, anytime it's black and white, there's just like a some brick wall goes up, you know. And uh, yeah. yeah, but I I always started with the same movie. I said, just watch this one movie. And if if you don't like it, I'll never buy gig in. And when I, I would always give them Laura and Good starter. almost every time they would like, can you bring more? You know? So <laughs> yeah, that was, that was fun. And when you mentioned our gang, I babysat my niece's two kids one time and uh, the boy was sitting there and he, he said, uh, I want to watch Popeye cartoons. Cause I've got a video projector and a big screen and all that. And he wanted to watch Popeye, but I know I had heard that he had gotten in trouble at school for bopping some kid. Oops. Yeah, so I was like, man, Popeye might not be the best choice. I said, well, let me put this other thing on for you. So I put on the, like, 1932 Our Gangs, and he said, well, I'm not going to like this. And I said, well, just give it a chance, you know. And he says, and he always said, is that a gray film? Which basically means it's oh, black and white, yeah. you know. And I said, well, yeah, just put, just watch one of them. It's 20 minutes long. If you don't like it, I'll turn it off. I'll go get something else for you to watch. And I started it up, and he sat there for the next three hours watching it. You know, just wow. never heard a peep from him. So Success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I know my intro movie I voiced on people who say they hate old black and white movies is Some Like It Hot. Oh, American yeah. Monroe. yeah. And they're like, oh. Mm -hmm. And they're the thin man. Yeah. But I always find myself explaining away the first 10 minutes of any of these movies. I'm like, now don't get bored. It's a slow intro because they used to take their mm -hmm. time setting it up. Like if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you watch the thin man, 1934, the first 10 minutes is sort of like, it's sort of slow moving. You're meeting the thin man of the title, the inventor guy. And, and there's some interactions that end up later being clues as, as to what happened to him. But it's, you know, and then, and then it's the movie really starts when, Myrna Loy walks into the bar where she finds William Powell drinking and she's got all her shopping and she wipes out with the dog. And I'm like, if you can just, I'm like, just take, don't, don't expect it to be too exciting until that moment. And then from that moment on, it's just hilarious and yeah. it never loses you. So sometimes I'll give a little warning, like, you know, these older movies, sometimes they take their time setting up the plot, but then yeah, give it a chance because modern movies start with an explosion, you know, like, that's the first thing. And then and then they'll introduce you to the characters later. But, you know, they don't they they didn't do it that way. So sometimes it needs a little little intro. But, yeah, yeah it's good to have those movies to pull out and say, you think you don't like these. Yeah, That's I was good. when I was watching one of your uh, film detective interviews and you talked about how in the older films, they would stay on a shot for a while. But now it's just cut, 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 cut. Yeah. And uh, when I was. I retired a few years ago, but I was a film or a tape editor for 40 years, you know, at TV stations. And the last few years, because we would edit promos for the station and I would put in this nice camera move shot in there, but it would last three or four seconds. And my boss would always come in and go, need to chop that up and put two or three other shots. And I'm like, you know, we just had arguments all the time, but I just I finally gave up. Yeah. I mean, I really noticed that watching even movies, movies from the 70s. What we just watched The Long Goodbye. Who is it that plays him? L.A. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Philip Marlowe. Yeah. Philip Marlowe. And they just they just take their time. There's like it's just him in his apartment and you're you're sort of getting to know him for mm -hmm. a minute or so where he's just cats in the room and he's just doing whatever, washing a pan out. They don't take their time introducing you to characters like that no. anymore. It's just I know. Right, right into the action. I, I missed that. 
that issue of patience and pacing reminds me, gives me a chance to plug another personal favorite movie of mine, which I haven't managed to get Jim to watch yet, but, and it's from the seventies. It's a movie called Fire Sale. It was written by the author of Where's Papa and uh, Weekend at Bernie's, Robert mm-hmm. Klein. And it's along that line of kind of, I guess you would say, poor taste comedy. <laughs> it's the only movie that's ever made me literally laugh myself sick. Alan Arkin directed it, mm-hmm. and it's got a great ensemble cast. With, um, Vincent Gardenia, Kay Medford, Rob Reiner, wow. Sid Caesar, Alex Rocco. Wow. Um, and there's this scene in it where... I don't want to give too much of it away, but the shtick with Rob Reiner's character is that when he gets intimidated by his father, he goes into kind of an asthma attack. He starts wheezing, gets an asthma attack. And there's a scene where Rob Reiner delivers some news to Vincent Gardenia, some bad news. Gardenia returns the favor with some bad news. Reiner goes into his wheezing thing, and in reaction to what Vincent Gardenia hears from Rob Reiner, he starts moaning, and it gets into this kind of rhythmic wheeze moan thing, and it's it's funny, and 99% of the directors in the world, there's a point where they'd say, okay, cut, we go to the next scene. It continues on. And it gets to a point where you can kind of go through this process of, you know, okay, joke's done. That's funny. Let's, let's move on. To something. But then it reaches a threshold where it becomes even funnier just by virtue of how long it's gone on. And mm-hmm. I always consider that a, a brave a directorial decision to, to let it go on that long uh, on the part of Alan Arkin. But yeah. um, anyway, I feel like Mel Brooks does that sometimes too where it's like, it just keeps going like a certain joke, even like a gag. And then it just, because you're like, okay, but then it keeps going and you end up laughing harder. Yeah. Yeah. Now the What's one, the name of that movie you were just talking yeah, about. Cool. So I can yeah. make a note. Fire sale. And Fire it took, sale. It took forever to come out on home video. It frustrated me a lot in the, I guess the eighties or, or whatever, when I would try to, catch it uh, and record it off of a, a tv broadcast because it would the, it would be edited to the point of ridiculousness they bleeped mm-hmm. the word crap for instance and <laughs> i i remember i recorded it one time and thought you know it's just going to irritate me every time i watch this so i'm just not even going to keep this copy it finally came out on video as a uh, video on demand dvd mm-hmm. uh, from fox and the only reason I saw it in the first place was because I was working at the theater where it played and it played a very short time. The studio did not support it to any mm-hmm. degree. I don't even think we got any one sheets on it. It's like it had come and gone, mm-hmm. but it is, uh, as I say, it, it is the only movie to make me literally laugh myself sick. Okay. I will put it on my list. <laughs> yeah. Now getting back to the the format and the, the content of your book, it's got a section now as I said, the one that, that I have here, the director's cut, and maybe you want to describe what distinguishes that from a prior edition of the book? Yeah. So the, the first edition was really short. Everyone said, oh, it needs to be short. It needs to be short. And then we decided, no, all the stuff we left out, we should just put back in. So we just released it new with stuff that I'd only cut out only to make it shorter, not because we didn't want it in there, but it came out, you know, in the time of COVID. So we did these homeschool homeschool projects and teacher's guide if teachers wanted to use it, which some teachers do. And I've gone into some like elementary schools and I, I'll bring, um, I send them the YouTube clip of one of our movies that Weston and I intro, and then I'll come in and read from my book, talk about old movies. And then we run an episode of classic films for kids. But in the end, in the back part, there's this adorable, I guess, business that's in Sonoma County where I happen to live called Little Monsters Culinary. And Weston took some of her classes, but she teaches kids how to cook and it's adorable. And they go in and they put little aprons on and she helps them measure the flour. And then they like, you know, you you drop your kids off for two hours and come back and they've made cookies. So I talked to her and she came up with these cute recipes to pair 
um, a movie night and recipe pairing. So she took a movie that I was featuring in the book and came up with a fun thing that you could make at home and make a, you know, an appetizer or something to go with your movie. So for the Gold Rush 1925 with Charlie Chaplin, she um, has a little recipe, Gold Rush Golden Chicken Nuggets. <laughs> yeah. So they're just fun things. And she made them themed to a movie. And it's easy recipes kids can do for a trip to the moon, trip to the moon edible constellations. And it's just like pretzel sticks and little marshmallows and you mix them together in a bowl. And so just, just wanted to do something that would be fun that maybe would be interactive to do at home. And then there are some other things where kids can write in it. Movies are magic because, and I want kids to think about what is it that makes movies magic because they really are magic. <laughs> you think you're watching movement and you know, you're really not exactly. Right. Um, and then you can make a zoetrope which is, you know, the old school to teach them uh, like the persistence of vision and the visual, like wh why does, why do we think we're watching reality moving in front of us when it's really a artificial reality, but to help kids kind of understand how that works. And then just some ideas of things they can do, walk like the tramp, learn to tap dance. And then I have some things, some fun ways that you kids can dress up for Halloween. So what, these are all Weston in here. These are costumes he's been over the years. He's been Fred Astaire with his little top hat and tap shoes. Of course, he was Spanky from the Little Rascals. And now that he's older, he wants to do other cool things like, you know, be a teenage mutant ninja turtle, <laughs> things like that. But he was really little. He didn't care. So I could dress him up any way I wanted. And then just some ideas of modern era films to watch. So I listed the artist from 2011 because that's such a beautiful homage and it's black and white and modern audiences seem to accept it. So that's kind of, to me, a good intro. Uh, of course, Hugo Chaplin, Who Framed Ro Roger Rabbit and The Majestic. Just some ideas of movies that kids could watch. And then I, you know, say there's things you can look for when you're on vacation. Filming locations is a fun way to maybe make a trip exciting for kids. And then that's it. Just, just some ways to make it fun and Maybe not just watching the movie, but things you can do around it. And I, lo I love the idea of, you know, maybe have inviting some other kids over if you're got, doing a sleepover. And so what I try to do is let's wa let's watch a uh, Buster Keaton short before we watch the modern new Disney movie or, you know, whatever they're going to watch that they know about and they want to see. So there's little ways you can just I feel like it's important just to bring it into their world and into their lives and maybe not even make a big deal about it. But these are just as legitimate entertainment as something new coming out, you know, this year, because it, like you said, I think there's like this weird mental block. Oh, it's black and white. That means it's boring and it doesn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I think if you just find ways to introduce them and make it something that's just part of the normal entertainment world of things that they can access and watch, hopefully that will mean there's a future generation of classic movie fans and you know, things, vintage things always come around, you know, 80s is cool again. And I'm, I just wish it would go back a little further <laughs> into, the, yeah. into the 30s. Yeah, that's like a thought I had the other day. I was thinking, you know, classic rock's just not what it used to be. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let me ask, what kind of response have you gotten from the book? The feedback? Um, wonderful. Um, teachers like it for the reasons you said, and you can kind of have this book for the kids and then show them a movie. And at least it gives them some perspective and a little bit of background and context before they watch something. And, you know, that always makes a movie more interesting. I think, you know, Citizen Kane is a more fun watch if you read about it first, because you don't really realize all the techniques that he implemented. And so you watch for those things. So, you know, learning about something a little bit before you just watch it can I think make it more interesting and better and more fun. Some people like to just not have any of that and just watch the movie and interpret it in its pure experience. But I, 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 I like to learn about things before I watch them. And so teachers love it. And when I go to the TCM Film Fest, my friend Christy jokes, she's like, you're like a celebrity here because people come up and want me to sign their books and take their picture with me. And that's that is the only place in the world <laughs> that that happens to me. It doesn't happen walking down the street. But so, you know, in the in the in the world of classic movies, I've had just nothing but no one. No, I haven't gotten any bad reviews and no one said anything negative to me about it. And a lot of people have said that, you know, they're glad there is a book like this that they can pull out and share. A lot of grandparents buy it as a gift for their grandkids. 
So I, I think it's, you know, of course, I would love more people to know that it's here. It's, it's in some libraries. I don't know how you get in all the libraries, how that happens, but I, I've, it does. It is carried in some libraries. Yeah, I would just like it. I'd like it to get out there more, really just because it's my passion and I want more kids to know how awesome classic movies are. Uh, well, you mentioned a potential sequel. I guess I, the first question would be, are you working on one? But then also, what would the nature of it be? Would it be going beyond 1939, maybe focusing at the same age, only films after 1939, or maybe stepping it up in terms of the, the age of the target audience? Yeah, I, it would be it would be the same target audience. So it's sort of, I'm working on it. and It's not finished. But yeah, starting in 1940. The hard part is trying to find... It's harder the, in the newer years to find child appropriate films that you can teach them about like film noir. But I'm like, what's a film noir a kid can watch? <laughs> you know, because I want to teach them about these genres and things, but there's not everything's appropriate for kids. So that's a little bit harder, but I still am working on that. And I'm also I'm working on a Spanish version of just of this edition because um, a lot of people have said, well, it'd be great to have this in Spanish. And I do have a lot of Spanish language movie references in here. I don't go all over the globe and my references, you know, there were movies being made all over the world and I don't have Russian films and German films in here. Um, but I do happen to have like some of the Mexican stars and, you know, the Spanish language Dracula and, and that. So right. I was like, this, you should just translate the whole book into Spanish. So we're working on that right now. So there will be a Spanish language version probably this summer. Okay. Well, you might want to include uh, Iran Trece if that's the correct pronunciation of it the spanish language version of charlie chan carries on which is yeah. the only version of that film that survives yeah i will make sure i'll put a note to make sure i don't leave that out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went it's to hard, it is hard the hardest part is is cutting stuff out because there you know this was like twice as long and you know i left out like the first native american film that was the documentary that they filmed you know up in canada um which is you know might have been like the first one just featuring only Native Americans. But, you know, you can't overwhelm. I, that was the other, I'm like, what is my goal? My goal is to introduce them, get them excited and understand the linear connection. So sometimes we would cut some stuff out if it just felt like it was going all over the place too much because, you know, it could, it could be like this thick, <laughs> a kid's book this thick. So I did, some things are left out only because of that. Like, is it is it helping us get the goal of just introducing and hopefully it inspires kids to want to go learn more and, you know, watch TCM every day or whatever, whatever's, that's my favorite network, of course, but there's a lot of streaming channels, the film detective, there's, there's a lot of places to find classic movies and on YouTube too. And all the classic films for kids, our show is on, is streaming for free on YouTube, on the film detective YouTube channel. There's a playlist, classic films for kids, so you can find it there too. And it doesn't cost anything to watch it on YouTube, obviously. Perfect. Uh, Jim, you had something there? When the uh, Spanish language Dracula was discovered back in late 80s, early 90s, I went to a screening of that. The USA Film Festival had it here in Dallas uh -huh. and uh, went to the screening. And then Lupita Tovar was there and did a Q&A afterwards. Wow. Yeah, it was <laughs> oh my great. Gosh. Yeah, it was really Lucky. awesome. <laughs> Those are, yeah, there's, there's, when you love these old movies and you go seek them out and go to things like that, you really, mm -hmm. you have these. Oh, once in a lifetime kind of experiences. All right. Well, that's been a nice uh, summary of the book and it's just really fun one. I would encourage any, anyone who has kids that you want to expose to classic films, you know, whether it's something that you're personally into that much or not, but with so much stuff out there that's inappropriate for kids these days, I mean, this is, this is a really great way to give them a whole area that they can learn about and explore and entertain themselves in the process. So I would really encourage you to pick up a copy of Jennifer's book, Movies Are Magic. So Jennifer, that brings us to the standard question that I ask all my guests, and that is, what is your most memorable moviegoing experience? I've had a few, but I would say like the big, the big one. I went and saw Napoleon. Abel Gantz's Napoleon at the Paramount in Oakland. It must have been maybe 2011, 2012. Could probably look it up. It was brought in by the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, and then they had the, the Oakland Orchestra play live. It was a whole day movie experience. <laughs> it was like an eight hour movie experience because the film itself is uh, like five and a half hours, something like that. They had 
they had a few um, intermissions and then a dinner break. And I think I paid like $150 or something to go see this one movie. And I don't know if you've seen it or if you've seen it in a theater on a, like they call it what the triptych screen where it was played on the three screens. It was incredible. I wasn't yeah. bored one minute of that yeah. movie. And then the end, he's doing all this, like all the, you know, just the quick editing and showing all the flashing back to the images from earlier in the film. And then he adds some color and it's all happening on three screens. And he's got his, the close up of Napoleon and then his spirit animal or whatever, the eagle and, and then the French flag. And it's just like all these images flashing and the orchestra's just, you know, going crazy. And I, everyone stood up in the theater and I was bawling. I was like crying, not because I like love Napoleon, but I'm like, I am experiencing a once in a lifetime work of art. It was incredible. And it was playing again the next day. And I almost went back and watched it again the next day. And then I thought, you know what, I'll just keep that perfect experience. And I'm still kicking myself because I decided it was too expensive to go up there. I should have sold my car as yeah. I look back now, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The it was, only it would have been worth it. Oh yeah. <laughs> to sell yeah. your car. <laughs> yeah. Well that okay. Well I think that puts Napoleon in definitely in the lead because over the the episodes that we've done that's been mentioned more times than any other film as somebody's most memorable movie going experience. Well, that's the only time the Kevin Brownlow cut has been run in the United yeah. States. Yeah. yeah. I think usually Wars... it's the Coppola version that, mm -hmm. that we see here. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one that I saw uh, mm -hmm. back in the, in the eighties. That's the only one I've seen theatrically. I have the Blu-ray of the five hour restoration and mm -hmm. The, as I understand, there's they're on the verge of premiering a seven hour restoration. Yeah. So that'll be uh, another. Yeah, I have a friend who yeah. already has her ticket to go to Paris to see the screening there. So. Wow. So that'll Do you be know something. when that is. Do you remember? I think it's uh, <laughs> trying to figure it's out a way either to sometime this summer or it's like probably within the next six months, I think. So. OK. I haven't been following that. So I'll, I'll look it up when we're done. Yeah, here. it's the French, like the French film preservation whoever Cinematic. that is you know oh. yeah mm -hmm. uh they've been working on it and i guess they are not dealing at all with brownlow so if it's oh yeah so I, i'm not sure you know where they got their material tired or... too i've met him a few times which is mm -hmm. like the only person i fangirled over at the tc <laughs> bus i was oh, yeah. walking down the street and he walked by with his wife and i was with my friend i'm like that was kevin brownwell <laughs> brownlow and i like turned around and you know annoyed him on the street yeah. <laughs> i haven't met him yet but that sounds like my reaction the time i met david shepherd so <laughs> yeah i haven't had the pleasure of meeting him in person but i did a few months ago uh, springing out of this podcast i made a uh, kind of a pen pal uh, of him mm -hmm. via email so we've had some some nice exchanges that way and i hope to someday have the chance to meet him he has a copy of my book my children's book ah. we exchanged books he gave me the uh, the parades gone by, and I gave him movies are meant to. Wow! <laughs> so okay, that was that was exciting for me. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Did he sign it for you? Uh, he signed. Yeah, we signed each other's. Yeah. Oh, I signed mine to perfect. him. Perfect. He signed. Very his nice. Very I think cool. I got the better. <laughs> well, anyway. gi given his his uh, his status as an icon of cinema history, I wouldn't want to argue. As terrific as your book is, I, I would say if I did have to choose between a signed copy of yours and a signed Kevin Brownlow, but I think I would have to lean Kevin's way. But uh, so, would, so would I. <laughs> uh, but anyway, all right. Well, Jennifer, I really appreciate you coming on with this to talk about this and, and your book. It's been a fun discussion and I look forward to seeing what you do next. So be sure and keep us posted on that. And in the meantime, everyone, uh, well, you know, you can start with picking up a copy of Movies Are Magic, the book, and then seek out via YouTube or other sources, uh, her other projects, the Movies Are Magic radio show, podcast. What was the, the series actually called on YouTube? Um, classic Films for Kids. Classic Films for Kids. Yeah. Lots of fun stuff. So uh, be sure and take advantage of Yeah, of I watched your Gulliver's Travels show. That was... Oh, thank I you. I enjoyed that. Yeah. That's, right. a good, that's a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen that in a long time. I'll have to, I'll have to go look at that now. Watch, watch my episode. No. <laughs> uh, I, that's exactly the, the way I uh, anticipate doing it. So awesome. once again, Jennifer, thank you for joining us on movie nights and matinees. It was lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been super fun. 
If you know any potential young film buffs, be sure to visit the bookshelf page of the podcast website, where you'll find an Amazon link for Jennifer's book, Movies Are Magic. Don't forget to click on the follow, subscribe, or download button wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and, where possible, a review. If you happen to have listened to this episode by way of its link on the Movie Nights and Matinees website, you may have noticed a new feature, which is a link above the description where you can quickly and easily click to send a comment or question. Of course, the Facebook page is always a good place to do that, as well as potentially interact with other listeners and see bonus material related to the episodes. Well, that wraps up episode 31. Time now to hit the trail in pursuit of episode 32. I am so sorry. I cannot travel with you in these very dangerous countries, but I wish you a very safe and pleasant journey. Happy autumn.